Welcome. Uh, we're in conversation today with three experts, three people that are really at the coalface of humanitarian responses in, in general times. But in these times of COVID, you know, these people are even more important to share with us some of the challenges, but also, you know, the face of older people in humanitarian disasters and responses. In preparation for this town hall meeting, I did go back to, I think it was May 7, when, yes, it was, May 7, you know, the COVID-19 humanitarian response plan. And in that response, you know, we were quoted, I wasn't quoted, the UN was quoted, as saying that at that time, there were 3.6 million people that had been diagnosed with COVID and 247,650 people had died from COVID. You know, July 29, and the number is extraordinarily high, which really exposes and puts a face to the tragedy of human life and human experiences in the pandemic. There's over 17 million people today that have been diagnosed with COVID-19 and 667,000 people who have died from this uh, infectious disease. So it is timely um, to, to listen and to talk with people who are at the coalface of humanitarian responses. And ordinarily, we think about humanitarian responses as sometimes short, you know, in the response. You know, I think of, you know, the tsunami in Japan several years ago. Um, but in this time, we're really looking at what is the long-term humanitarian response. Before I invite our speakers, of which there are three today, I want to just pay respects to UN Dessa, Amal Abu Rafay. Now, as you know from last week's town hall, you know, Amal is formidable in her persuasion. And it really is the leadership of Amal that has actually brought together these three key experts. And they're from the UN High Commission for Refugees, Help Age International, and the International Federation of Red Cross. So let me just introduce um, all three speakers and then I will hand it over to Ricardo. So Ricardo Pla Cordero works as protection officer within the Division of International Protection at the UN High Commission for Refugees. Um, you know, I looked back through some of the work of the UN Refugee Agency and the principles, Ricardo, and the principles really fit uniquely, they're uniquely placed in the world of older people. Rights-based, inclusion, participation, and non-discrimination. So Ricardo will be our first speaker. And then depending on our technical expertise here, um, and hopefully we'll have Anna Tifensi, you know, and she's coming all the way from Sweden. And she is a volunteer of the Red Cross in Sweden but she's also worked in a professional capacity as a nurse and trained at the Red Cross Nursing School in Stockholm. And finally, we welcome Alicia Robertson, you know, from Help Age International. Um, and you're the Humanitarian Protection Manager. You know, I was talking with Alicia beforehand and you assumed that position in November 2019. So I don't know any other person that's been kind of thrown in into, you know, one of the most important but tragic pandemics of our lifetime. So we welcome you, Alicia, and I know that you're stepping into the shoes of Verity, who's not able to be with us today. So thank you all. Really enjoy the experience of this town hall, and I hand the floor over to Ricardo. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Jane. And I would like to, well, to thank the, the International Federation on, on Aging for providing this opportunity. Um, I would like as well to express my condolences to all persons who have lost a beloved one or a family member during this, this pandemic. They, it is experience that is getting closer and closer to ourselves. I'm, I'm getting some feedback from you, Jane. Thank you. Um, so it is, it is something that I would like as well to, to share. Well, I've been asked to, to give, uh, to set the ground for this discussion. And I would like to, to share uh, some information on 
the profile of the population that we are uh, going to discuss today, some of the situations that they are experiencing using data that we have been receiving through our operations, and as well uh, discuss a little bit without a lot of detail. I don't want this to become a heavy discussion, but what is the policy framework and what are some of the gaps within the policy framework as well? Because as we will see, we are not looking at the short term um, type of response as many times it happens or is the understanding in humanitarian action. This is a, this is a situation that is going to be lasting for, for a long period and looking at what has to be done in terms of policy will be as well interesting. Just as a reminder, UNHCR uh, is an a, a organization with a mandate to provide international protection uh, and to work on solutions for refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced persons and stateless persons. Those are some of the profiles of older persons that we will be discussing today, but there will be other older persons as well living in humanitarian contexts that do not fall under these categories. I would like to highlight that. Uh, every year, UNHCR releases a report that is called Global Trends, and there it gathers information through a, a, a variety of sources on the numbers of persons who are living in forced displacement and, and reminding these categories that I've mentioned before. So for 2019, 79.5 million uh, persons uh, were forcibly displaced from their homes. That means nine more million than only the previous year and almost 100 million across a decade that has been called a decade of displacement. Uh, within that population, the data that we have access to uh, highlights that the refugee population that are older persons or that are 60 and above, which is, is a, well, a difference, is a, around 4% compared to the world population, 12%, if that data is correct, and international migrants who are older persons as well, 17%. Now, this would amount to approximately 3 million or 3.18 million of uh, older persons who are forcibly displaced from their homes due to persecution, violence, and human rights violations. These data, however, can as well pose questions. Well, first, uh, there is no United Nations standard definition or numerical criterion to identify older people. And that is one of the first problems. While in many contexts, the age of 60 and above is going to be used to refer to the uh, older population, the impact of forced displacement may cause as well displaced populations to age faster than settled populations. As a consequence, many challenges associated with old age will appear in forcibly displaced populations who are in their 50s and even in their 40s. On the other hand, older persons are not a heterogeneous group. We have situations that will vary uh, according to gender, the experiences and the risks exp uh, and, and the barriers uh, experienced by older women are not comparable to those compared uh, to, to those faced by older men. And we have as well, if we use estimations uh, from WHO in 2011, around 46% of older people with, with a disability. Now, this data, if we use as well 2019 data uh, that was disaggregated by disability in situations of conflicts and, and, co and forced displacement, we have that the, the uh, prevalence of disability tends to be higher in this context. And just giving an example, in Aleppo, it has been reported that almost 100% of all the population living there would experience a functional difficulty in their daily activities that would be comparable to that reported in a, in a situation of disability. Uh, it is important to highlight as well that uh, older persons, older men, older women, contribute to the to their communities and their families in situations of, of displacement and recognize that capacity. For example, it is well documented and, and many times, unfortunately, that older men and, and women are 
critical caregivers for children who are uh, either lost their parents or they're separated from, from them during displacement. Um, now, with this as a background, going to COVID, uh, as many of you will know, the, the UN Secretary General released a report on and a policy brief on COVID-19 and its impact on all persons and specifically uh, calling to address the high risk faced by older people in emergencies. Now, we need one of the issues that we need to consider and, and what has been shared before is that the while, while there's a, a good amount of the impact or information on the impact of older persons across the globe, the data on persons who are living, older persons who are living in, in forced displacement is much more scarce. Uh, there are structural problems to collect this information, but as well inequities and barriers that based both on aging and their displacement status are going to put that population at higher risk. We should go as well uh, beyond our understanding or, or the information or the image that comes to ourselves when uh, we think of humanitarian settings. Usually we are going to think of those traditional camps or camps similar uh, related uh, settings, while uh, as I said, uh, the experience of displacement is going to follow those persons across the globe. Persons who are fleeing within their own country and are setting in another areas where they have less contacts, less information, there may be less welcomed by service providers in that area that are not ready to absorb that population that's been displaced, but as well neighboring countries or third countries where older persons are resettled and where they would not speak the language, where they would have as well uh, policy barriers, institutional barriers, uh, just lack of a card and I, uh, that would allow them to enjoy the same services as other, other uh, persons of their same age in their context. Um, what UNHCR has been working on in the, in the last period and following commitments and talking here a little bit about the policy, background. Uh, UNHCR has a policy on age, gender and, dis and, and diversity and as well a policy on elder refugees. Following those commitments, uh, UNHCR has worked with operations and partners to monitor protection risks and situations of discrimination in particular in accessing COVID-19 prevention and response. And our uh, operations could report on a a number of uh, profiles, including older persons living in, in displacement. Just sharing some of the, of the data that have been reported, in, including reduced access to information, where digital information has overwhelmed everybody, but have had little access or has been accessed very scarcely by persons who do not have access to digital technology at large, and those are among those older persons who are refugees are the among the last ones. Um, but as well, difficulties in, in meeting basic needs, in accessing health services where those were available for other persons of the same age in their context, uh, treat, having access to treating chronic, uh, chronic me medical conditions, as well an increase of uh, gender-based violence against older women. Um, and uh, some, a, 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 let's say a difficult situation where older groups, uh, older persons and other groups at risk have been returning to their places of origin, even if there's violence still happening there, using as well irregular entry points uh, have been reported as well. And the reasons uh, that have been collected is shortage of access to health services and the inability to afford healthcare related costs in the situation of COVID. So um, what are some, just some of the responses that UNHCR have put in place? Well, advocacy has been one, one of them with governments to facilitate access to services for refugees and asylum seekers on an equal basis with others as well supporting governments 
to make uh, or to face the additional cost for the health system that this would mean. Um, then sharing information uh, in, in multiple and, and accessible channels, including just as, as an example, uh, younger refugees have been producing illustrations, but as well participating as volunteers to provide information for older refugees uh, in, in, in an accessible and same language. Um, there has been as well response to uh, shield and protect uh, older persons at higher risk in reception centers where reception of refugees happen. Measures included reducing the number of residents in, per room or transferring groups at higher risk into other accommodations such as apartments. Now, and of course, cash assistance, and targeted cash, cash assistance has been there. Uh, just to close, uh, those should be seen only as first steps in a comprehensive response, uh, because we should be looking as well at, at the longer term impact of the crisis. And I would like to recall that in May, the European Network of National Human Rights Institutions called uh, on states to strengthen human rights of older persons within COVID-19 pandemic and stressing the urgent need to commence, uh, to commence drafting or to start drafting the, and adopting a new convention that would fast foster better understanding of the scope and meaning of human rights of older persons and therefore facilitate the development of adequate, adequate policies to implement them. What I would like to stress is that the rights of older persons living in forced displacement should be as well reflected hopefully in case that this new convention comes to life. And with this, I would like to, to thank and give the word back to Jan. Thank you. Look, thank you very much, Ricardo. You know, you really have given us a, a snapshot, you know, of, of the work in your agency. But I think you've also highlighted some of the, the efforts that we as a population focus on, and that is the Convention on the Rights of Older People. What I need to learn more about from you and your colleagues is around, you know, displacement and it's about the long term efforts. You know, we're in the beginning of a marathon when it comes to humanitarian responses and we collectively have a. So I thank you for um, your opening remarks. It's now my great pleasure to hand the floor to Anna. Ten oh, I beg your pardon. I knew I was going to mispronounce your name, Anna Tifensi. Anna Tifensi from Sweden. So we welcome you because you have some really important messages to share with us. Where are you, Anna? Yeah, I'm here. I hope Wonderful. you can hear me. I, can, I yeah. can see you and hear you. Good, so good. Welcome. Off you go. Thank you. And now I'm I to tell you how I am a senior in my 80s and we, in many ways, I'm privileged since I have a husband we are both fit we live in a house and a garden and in this way we are not so dependent on help we do we are very grateful for our red cross the community red cross because they have taken consideration to us illness not to put their message on Facebook or social media. No, they have written letters to us and put in our letterboxes that they have volunteers who can help us with various things like shopping, food, which is very necessary. And also they are connected with our library and can borrow books for us and leave them at our house. So I feel that the Red Cross is really wonderful for us elders here in um, Ballstar, where I live. And Ballstar, I live east of Stockholm. Is there anything else I can tell you? Well, I think that what we will do is we're going to have lots of questions in a few minutes. Um, mm. But I also want to just, um, just acknowledge your husband, who must have been in the background, just to make sure that um, you said all the right things. Um, and uh, um, so, well, I we, so much. well, we <laughs> welcome you. You know, what's really intriguing, and I really didn't think about Red Cross in Sweden. So you've really given me a glimpse, you know, of 
some of the actions that Red Cross is involved with in you know countries all around the world. And I just want to acknowledge Lola Adu Adewumi, um, who is uh, on the line from uh, the International Federation of Red Cross. So thank you, Lola. And questions can be directed to Lola as well as to Anna. We now move to um, Alicia Robinson from Help Age International. You have the floor, Alicia. Thank you. Um, so just to start, for those who aren't familiar with HelpAge, um, we're a global network of organizations focused on improving the lives of older people in lower middle income countries. Um, we've been around for more than 30 years and we've got over 100 affiliates working in more than 70 countries. We've got a dual mandate for development and humanitarian response. Um, from the emergence of COVID-19, it was clear that there was a disproportionate immediate health impact for older men and women. Um, and the initial humanitarian response activities that um, were in response to this were really around awareness raising and prevention. Um, we had an emphasis on accessible information provision to enable older men and women to understand what COVID-19 was and to protect themselves um, from transmission of the virus. Um, but to better understand the situation of uh, older men and women, their needs and their preferences, um, in order to design our programs and in order to craft advocacy messaging that would be um, useful, um, we carried out a series of rapid needs assessments. And these are multi-sector surveys that we carry out in the countries in which we work. Um, I don't wanna go too deeply into the methodology of the rapid needs assessments, but just to say that a key tenant of them is that we speak to older people directly in humanitarian context and in this case, we did so in some development contexts as well, um, to understand their needs and their preferences. And we usually ask in these surveys uh, a question about whether or not older men and women have been um, consulted as part of humanitarian response prior to our um, delivery of the survey. And we, found, we have found in our previous surveys that um, upwards of 70% of older men and women um, have not been consulted typically in humanitarian response. And so um, humanitarian responses are being developed without, in the absence of the information about the needs and preferences um, of older people directly. So we've done these COVID uh, RNAs, we call them rapid needs assessments, in 20 countries across Africa, Asia, Europe, the Middle East, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Um, we finalized six reports to date, but we're working rapidly to finalize more in the coming weeks. Um, and I, I wanted to just share a, a, a couple of key findings with you from the reports. They're obviously very broad and there's a lot of information, but I thought I'd hone down on a couple. Um, some challenges remain, of course, on the accessible information, um, but we found that there was a broad awareness of what COVID um, is at this stage, um, with challenges in operationalizing prevention, um, just because of lack of materials or resource. Um, but we also found that there, in addition to the health impacts and prevention and awareness, there were some devastating secondary impacts of COVID-19 um, for older men and women, um, which are requiring attention. Um, so most people in lower and middle income countries rely on irregular, unreliable, multiple income sources in older age. And those could include things like pensions, employments, small business um, funds, assets, savings, and a lot of financial support from family and friends. Um, but only 20% of people living in those lower middle income countries have a pension with women far less likely to have pensions than men. And of course, this lack of income has a knock on effect on immediate food security for older men and women. Um, our rapid needs assessments in the past um, in humanitarian situations have recorded high levels of in uh, income in insecurity and um, borrowing and debt. Um, and this has resulted in high levels of food insecurity as well. Um, in the six reports that we have finalized to date, um, we asked older people directly about their priorities uh, and we asked them to rank those priorities. Um, food has ranked as the top priority in five out of six of those rapid needs assessments um, with livelihoods also featuring heavily in the top three in the other assessments as well. Um, so, for example, food was ranked as the top priority by 88% of people in Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. Those are people who are part uh, Rohingya refugee um, population. 81% of people that we surveyed uh, reported that they've reduced the quantity of food that they've been able to eat since COVID-19, and 28% have reduced the quality of food. Um, in addition, 53% of people that we surveyed in Syria have less than two days of food available in the house. Um, and in Tanzania, our survey revealed that 54% of people surveyed said that they currently depend on humanitarian assistance completely to survive. 
Um, and then another um, area that we surveyed or that is included in the surveys that I thought it was relevant to bring up, um, COVID-19 has amplified the violence, abuse, and neglect of older people around the world. So before the pandemic, it was estimated that one in six older people were subject to abuse. And emerging evidence is indicating that this has sharply increased in many countries as a direct result of the pandemic. Um, assessments conducted with older people in humanitarian situations identified the main risks reported um, included increased violence and abuse, neglect and isolation. Um, so in Syria, for example, when older people were asked what they feel the increased risks for older women were during this time, the top two uh, risks were reported to be neglect at 62% and isolation at 54%. Um, in Bangladesh, there were very high perceived risks of emotional abuse at 75% and physical abuse at 36%. Um, because of some of the ethical challenges in data collection around violence, abuse and neglect as part of the rapid needs assessments, we also looked to secondary data. In Jordan, in the first two months of the lockdown that they had there, Help Age Network member Sigi received 812 requests for urgent help. 20% of those were related to domestic violence. They usually receive 650 calls in a year. So that's a market increase on their usual um, business as usual. So the reported numbers of people affected by abuse during COVID-19 do not reflect the reality. Also, we know this, um, people are less likely to report incidences. And even if they do, they might not have a telephone, they might be scared to report incidences. Um, often abuse is perpetrated by family members within the home um, who older people might be dependent on. And if they have no means to support themselves, they, they could fear that they would be threatened or worse if they ask for help. And so we know that there's significant underreporting of um, these areas of violence and abuse. Um, and in response to just these two limited areas, um, for example, uh, with the challenges that uh, older people have in terms of food security, you know, in the immediate humanitarian response, Help Age works um, to ensure that older people are identified for food support and that they have opportunities for an inclusion and in livelihoods programming. Um, oftentimes in humanitarian response where there's livelihood programming um, due to misconceptions about older people's age and ability or unintentionally because of lack of targeting, they're left out of livelihoods programming. So we really um, advocate for the inclusion of older people in these types of programming. Um, in the long term, however, uh, we're, we're taking a longer term view. So it's not just immediate humanitarian response. So we've got a long track record of working with network members to increase older people's access to social protection. And we've actually seen a lot of promise in terms of COVID-19 and what's happening. So over 100 countries have introduced or adapted social protection programs in response to COVID-19. Um, so we're seeing an expansion of programs, we're seeing uh, inclusion of more people into programs, and, and we'd really hope to see continued scale up of social protection program inclusive of uh, older persons, including access to pensions. Um, help Age is also working with communities to support them to prevent, uh, prevent and identify elder abuse um, and to safely access response services. And that would include um, access to counseling, legal advice, uh, et cetera. Um, we are advocating also for the prevention and response services that are inclusive of older people to be categorized as life-saving and essential. Um, and that governments, uh, adapt laws and policies to protect older people from violence, abuse, and neglect. Um, those are just a couple of the areas. So we've also seen um, considerable barriers in terms of access to essential goods and services, particularly around health and uh, nutrition. Um, we've seen marked um, impacts on older men and women um, in terms of mental health, um, just exacerbating really um, issues, uh, high levels of anxiety and worry. Um, but um, all of the reports as we finalize them are put onto our website. So I'm gonna share those um, as a resource after the call. I just wanted to share um, a couple of the findings, but there's a wealth of information in the reports that are online and I'd be very happy to answer questions if people have them. I'm on mute. So I said, thank you very much. And thank you for sharing such a wealth of information. You know, from all of the speakers, we've actually heard, you know, at the coal face, Anna in Sweden, that is receiving, you know, support and services. And Anna, I just wanted to pick up on, you know, one of the key messages that you gave us that you got a letter in the post. You know, it wasn't on social media. And I think that's really important. Both Ricardo and Alicia, you know, talked about you know, the information that is being gathered, the data that is being gathered. And, you know, one of my questions would be, so what? And that's a rhetorical question, so forgive me. 
it's the so what. Um, so I'll put that so what question to one side. And in a minute, I'm going to ask um, Ken Bluestone from Age International to ask a question. But I have a question, Ricardo, that um, I think it, it sits in your bucket. Can you share with you know, the town hall participants, who are the key member states and donors that NGOs can target and work with to ensure inclusion of older people? What do we need to be asking of these governments, these member states? Because I think Alicia touched on advocacy messages. You know, if we go to our government, if it's one of the governments that you think, um, what, what's our ask? So perhaps if you can respond to that, and then I will ask Ken Bluestone and Cynthia Stewan. Over to you, Ricardo. That is not an easy <laughs> question <laughs> to, to answer. Um, I, I, can, I can answer, let's say, with a, a negative answer. The, as far as I know, there is not a particular forum of governments that visibly place themselves as supporter of the rights of older persons. And this is something that is already a gap. Uh, it, it could be, we could track, let's say, who are donors who have been traditionally uh, supporting more interventions in humanitarian action for older persons and that I'm sure that other colleagues, for example, help age or uh, organizations with a particular mandate on, on older persons would be better placed uh, to answer. What I can say is that for other groups at risk and, and putting an example as, uh, as I follow as well, persons with disabilities, there are formal networks and for example, GLAD is a, a global action uh, network of donors that formally support the rights of persons with disabilities and the implement, implementation on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. As, as far as I know, there's no comparable um, forum. Uh, on the other hand, there's the UN group on uh, aging, and, and there, I, I, and I think uh, we have members today uh, that could provide more more information. So uh, it, it is a let's say a negative uh, comment or remark that I have to provide in this in these regards. Well, I I think what you've done, Ricardo, is you know you've identified the gap, you know, and uh, and we see it not only as a negative, but we also see it as an opportunity that we need to to step into. And of course, we have online today the co-chair of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Older People, Garrop, who's going to ask the question next. And of course, we've got the Open Ended Working Group and the National Rights, the National Human Rights Institutions. So it's also for civil society to actually make those connections. Um, I'd like to call on Ken Bluestone and then Cynthia Stewan, please. Thank you, Ricardo. Thanks, Jane, and um, thanks to all the speakers. It's been a uh, really really um hugely educative and um, uh, for, for me just hearing and um, about the work you're doing inspirational i think um from, from all of you and it's it's great anna um to 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 have your first-hand experience of what you're going through as well so thank you um, i'm not going to talk about human rights and so no, i have a question about it but but it's as you see in the chat function in in the early stages of covid19 um, in our conversations with governments who are responsible for humanitarian response, um, the argument that we got back was that um, humanitarian principles shouldn't single out specific groups. You should be neutral, and that's the reason why they weren't going to prioritize older people above any other group. And obviously, from our perspective, that wasn't sufficient response, but I would be very, it would be, but that attitude, I think, still remains. There's a sense of, you know, why should we be talking about older people when there are all these other people there? But I guess it's just really about how do you push back on that sense that humanitarian principles, you know, should be neutral and shouldn't identify older people as a priority. So perhaps, um, Alicia, would you be able to pick up that question? Just a short answer so that we can make sure we can get a few questions on. Um, 
Yeah, so I think um, in terms of our work with HelpAge, we've recognized that um, you know, not identifying um, older people as a group who are disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, just the humanitarian principles don't necessarily ensure that people are going to be included. People aren't included by principles, they're included by action. So unless you're taking um, a, a positive action to ensure inclusion of people, um, then it's not going to happen. So it's not just down to, to having the principles, but it's down to making the steps um, to including, including older people. And I think um, we did a lot of work as HelpAge um, in the initial stages in terms of the development of the Global Humanitarian Response Plan, for example, which was quite blind in terms of um, inclusion of older people as a, as a specific group who required um, support in this regard. And so we did a lot of um, work to ensure that older people are explicitly included as a group that requires support, um, because if they're not explicitly included, then they're often omitted. Um, so I would say it, it's about, um, yeah, making visible the need and taking positive action, not just down to principles. And I think it's really important to say also that help age don't work independently. You know, there are NGOs that actually work with help age and help age work with others. So, you know, it's, you know, I think it's really important that we actually consolidate and confirm our partnerships and strengthen our voice as one body going forward, because otherwise, you know, the situation at the moment, older people in emergency context are not one of the focus areas identified at the open-ended working group. That should be shameful and a disgrace. So how do we encourage NGOs and also national human rights institutions to lobby for that to be part of the next open-ended working group? Surely this is the time. Um, I want to come to Cynthia, but before I do that, and I want to come back to you because, you know, you have, um, you know, talked about the importance of Red Cross in Sweden and how it's enabled you and your husband to continue to be, you know, independent. Can you speak any more about, you know, the value of Red Cross in, in Sweden for you? Anna, you're on mute. That's <laughs> well, Really, the Red Cross, when we got had all these refugees coming 2015, 2016, then they were extremely active, the Red Cross. And now with COVID, they also have become active. But we have many other institutions that also help elderly people. And as you know, the Scandinavian countries have a tremendous, we are not so densely populated in our countries. And we have a social system that honestly helps the elderly people very much if we compare with many other countries. But since we now are having more and more refugees in our country, and many of them are not very good and can understand Swedish properly, we have understood we must come out and give them far more help and really understand, have you realized what COVID means and all the precautions you must take? Also the home care people, it's difficult to get Swedish people to work with home care. The salary isn't good enough. And so many of our refugees are working in the home care business with elderly people and they haven't quite understood all these regulations. So as you know, we've had many deaths that have occurred in our elderly homes, which is, could have been prevented if we had given them a better education. In many ways, Sweden should have been more prepared than we have been. And okay. we also, I'm very sad to say, we didn't have enough supplies to begin with with masks and the um, disinfectant for the people working with elderly. Okay, thank you very much. And we welcome- I hope I have given you- You have, you just answer. Answer. There's, there's another question coming, I'm sure. And, and a wave to Mr. Tenthisa, who is just behind you. All right? Mm -hmm. So we go back to Cynthia. Cynthia, your question? If I may, I have two questions, uh, one for Alicia and one for Anna. 
I'll maybe start with Anna since you just spoke because it, it leads to the issue of accessibility for older persons, whether it be a cultural lack of understanding of your language or you know, you mentioned, Anna, people getting a letter in the mail, but if you, if you can't read it, um, either because you don't understand the language or you can't read it because you have macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy and you can't, don't have access, I just wondered if there were alternative ways that, that might have been or could be used uh, from your perspective. And then my second question is uh, to... Cynthia, stop there. We'll get yep. that answered and then we'll come back. Okay. I just want to have a shout out to Louise Gillis, who's on the uh, at our town hall, president of uh, Canadian Council for the Blind. So I just want to acknowledge her. Um, Anna, so your, your response to um, Cynthia. Well, you're absolutely correct. There are people who cannot, unfortunately, read the Swedish. But we have many groups, we call it cafes, where they can go and get help with our language. And of course, if there's disability, they do have carers who come and help them. So it's really the people that can live at home, take care of themselves and so forth. They also get much information about our um, all around the libraries have and our um, senior clubs are helping these people to learn the language and to understand and also they can bring formulas and papers that they have received and cannot read them and we will help them to fill in forms and to translate thank we you have, very uh, much yeah that, that's, that's great what I can okay Thank you. Um, Cynthia and then Roxana. Okay, Alicia, um, very Im impressive with the, the rapid uh, response assessments. And I'm, I know that Help Age, of course, would be involving older persons in their development. But I just wondered if you also involve older persons in country, in community, in the actual data gathering. And if if you do, if you have recommendations for how, um, how you do that. Um, yes, we do. I think, um, so uh, I've not been with Help Asia hugely um, long time, so I've got a more limited experience perhaps with some of the um, assessments that happened pre-COVID. I think COVID has presented some unique challenges um, in terms of the facts that, um, you know, older people are more likely to be, uh, for example, uh, perhaps observing movement restrictions um, due to the increased um, potential to contract a, a severe case of COVID they're more likely to not be moving beyond the home environment and so maybe haven't been um, as involved in the data collection in the COVID RNAs as previously. Um, but yes, absolutely. Um, usually with the Help Age teams would seek to um, involve older people's associations that we work with and reach out to our, our network members who um, are familiar with older people who have capacities to carry out um, data collection uh, and, and actually um, I think that's something that's really Im important for us as Help Age is to consider the capacities of older people themselves um, to participate in all of these exercises, to drive forward the humanitarian response, really, um, to help us collect information and then determine, uh, you know, older people are better placed than any of us to understand what the risks are that they face and how to mitigate those risks. Um, so absolutely, we involve them in, in all stages of the process. It has been a bit more of a challenge in terms of the COVID realities. However, where we have relied on our networks um, and older people's associations um, to understand and to triangulate information and, and all. I just want to just pick up on, on what you said, Alicia, and then spin back to what Ricardo said in his statements. I was, I was taken aback by, you know, your conversation about the critical caregivers, Ricardo, you know, and, you know, caring for those children who had lost their parents or had been separated from their parents. And then I, I moved to those older people who have decision-making disabilities and really depend on others to be their voices. And I think it's really, there's no one cookie cutter 
you know, we've actually got to look at the environment and the familial structure. Did you want to make a, a brief comment about that, Ricardo? Yes, absolutely. For some of the cases that I that I was uh, remembering as well when when sharing that update or thinking about your question, for example, in in Myanmar or or Syria. So when when families have been forced to flee in in conflict and only a grandfather and sometimes a baby have survived that that experience. So you may find a, a new family unit that is uh, formed by a, a, an older man on his 70s or his 60s, uh, more in that, in that context, and a child with, with few months or one year old. Uh, the, the wild you may have in, in, in the same area, a, an older person who is isolated or uh, living alone, and uh, family units as well, very numerous in size in, with an older person with a disability that may be even uh, acquired during the conflict because that is also something very important to note that disability may happen or impairments may happen during conflict fleeing or in incidents with, with uh, mine and explosive weapons, etc. cetera. And they, and they, capacity to cope with the disability, it, 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 it decreases with ages, I mean, with, with the age, uh, or it, it is limited as well, because there's, there's less coping strategies. They're going, and, and then just going back, I think, to, to the issue that Ken uh, mentioned in terms of equality or non-discrimination, or impartiality, that would be the particular principle that I would say back to those, uh, those situations. We cannot treat those profiles equally. Yeah. And we cannot think that our uh, policy, because our because own understanding, because I think it's a wrong understanding of, of impartiality of that particular principle, even if it says that there's no discrimination, uh, that, that humanitarian aid should be provided without discrimination, uh, the principle of non-discrimination uh, entitles and actually commits agencies to take particular steps to address inequalities and inequities. If not, it is a wrong understanding altogether. All with these three different family units, you may have a family unit that may have a certain capacity to, to access livelihoods, that big family unit, but that would require as well additional support for a member who have acquired a disability. In another one, you would have a, a, a family unit with low resources, and in, to, to access livelihoods, and in other one, a, a family unit, unit that requires, in addition, child protection interventions. So it is, it is absolutely absurd that because policies may seem neutral or programs may seem neutral, and we would say we do not discriminate anyone, everybody's welcome, everybody would have the same capacity to, uh, to access those uh, interventions. There is where proactive response need to be in place. Now, is this the understanding of every single humanitarian action worker in the field? No, because we are working in very limited environments with a very limited as well capacity to provide training, capacity building, and with a very weak sometimes knowledge management capacity because there's not a lot of, in, of information and because we build knowledge while we practice only. Look, that, that's that been very helpful for me. And I think that uh, you've given some really important tweets that I hope that my staff are going to pick up and that I'll, I'll replay back. You know, we're coming to 10 minutes to the hour. So I'm sorry, Roxana, but I'm going to move to um, our speakers to provide the town hall participants with a takeaway message. So this is a message that you really want everybody to hear from your perspective. And I will ask uh, Lola Adewumi to also um, just make a, um, um, a brief message. 
So Alicia, would you like to kick off? What's your message from, from Help Age International? Um, yeah, I think for, for me, um, it's going back to this idea that, uh, you know, older men and women aren't passive recipients of aid, um, that they're best placed to help us understand um, the situation that they are in and the mitigations that we can make um, to ensure you know, access to effective and safe and dignified assistance. And, and older people aren't a homogenous group. So the, we, as humanitarian agencies, um, we can't consider a, a one size fits all approach, but we might need to, to think to be more adaptive, um, to be more um, understanding of the different risks and vulnerabilities and capacities of people um, so that we can tailor humanitarian response to ensure that we're meeting needs. Um, and just to say as well that, you know, older people have those capacities capacities um, to be able to drive the humanitarian response. And so we need to embrace those and harness them um, as well, because we are not the experts. The older people who are in the humanitarian um, situation are the experts on their own um, humanitarian response. And, and to, of course, help build their capacities and capacities. Of course. Um, Anna, what's your takeaway message for us today? Anna, we need to un unmute you. Okay, well, for, for personally, for my own country, I wish that the home care staff will be given a better, um, what is it called? That's I've lost the word. They must go, um, they must education. Okay. They must be given, and especially those that come from other countries. And we need to give better salaries and raise the um, home care people and give them more status and especially more education because this would help very much. And also they can help their own people from countries that it's increasing our refugees, if you understand. Yes, yes, we've got it. And thank you very much for being part of the town hall today. So Lola, Lola from IFRC. Yes, thank you, Jane, um, for giving me the opportunity to, to add to Anna's remarks. Um, I think what's, what's really wonderful is that there's stories like Anna in our 192 Red Cross and Red Crescent societies around the world. So we are working in every country, in any, every context at the local level. Um, the support that Anna spoke to is from her local Swedish Red Cross branch. So we have over, I believe, over 190,000 branches around the world that are delivering that kind of support, whether it be the letters that people are receiving in their mailboxes, whether it be these safe door-to-door -door visits that our uh, 14 million volunteers are conducting around the world, whether it be visual aids. I think we're really trying to, to make the response local and understand that the local local action is how we are able to reach older people who are often forgotten in the response. Um, Alicia and Ricardo spoke wonderfully about this in the sense that um, older people are being forgotten, but they also have agency and they need to be included in the response and also um, remain visible. So thank you all for today's town hall and uh, thank you. Thanks, Lola. Um, Ricardo. I, I would like to take over the question of, and so what? The, the so what could be read in two ways. So what else needs to be done, but as well, what do we do with what hasn't been done? And that is making uh, whoever has to be accountable for their actions. The, the information that we gather, if, if we gather monitoring data and, and protection monitoring data, it is as well to make accountable governments, organizations, agencies for their actions or their omissions. And that it is important as well. Uh, discrimination can be targeted and can be monitored only when we raise those issues, when we have as well, and we didn't speak about feedback and complaint mechanisms that we ask service providers to give channels and, and we raise those issues and we support if they, 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 it's difficult for older persons to share those feedback directly. We support them to, to collect that information and that we keep that information and we insist on finding accountability and, 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 and a consequence uh, to that. 
and both, as I said, direct uh, discriminatory actions in, 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 for example, has been documented across the world on ageism and non including older persons on purpose and with all the documented information that exists on that, but as well cases of omission of presenting neutral programs that have not been responding to, to the needs because they have not been proactive enough. That would be my take. Well, thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, and as we wrap up, um, I'm sure you would agree that each of us have learnt something from our speakers today. But also, you know, we take away some of the questions that need to be answered. And one of them is about our accountability, you know, as CSOs. You know, and I just take the point of older people in the emergency context not being one of the focus areas in the Open Ended Working Group. What can CSOs be doing? I want to particularly thank Anna. Anna, you probably haven't seen the chat box, but there's lots of comments about, can we have more of the Annas of the world? So thank you for being part of our town hall. It's been really important to hear your voice, which links in you know, to what Alicia has been saying and also the work of, of Lola and Ricardo. Um, I go back to something that you said um, earlier. Um, Ricardo, and that is that we cannot treat those profiled equally. And I think that even for people that are working in the field of population aging and older people, we still tend to talk about the older people. And yet, you know, what you've described and speakers have described today, you know, is the nuance of, you know, a grandfather of 70 and a baby of three months who are left that's, that's the family that's left, you know, through the, the, um, the consequences of humanitarian disasters. So I thank you for that poignant comment as we go out. I also want to acknowledge that, you know, while it's not relative, you know, there are people in high and middle income countries, older people that are living in poverty, that are lining up for food stamps, that don't have running water, you know, indigenous populations. And I think while we talk about responses, we just need to be broader in our thinking also about people in every country that's represented today, you know, have older people that are living in dire situations. Um, and the responses will be different, but we also need to be accountable to those people and listen to their voices. So we thank the expert speakers today we also thank Amal from UNDESA for helping us to bring this important town hall together. It's been represented by people from UNDESA, UN High Commission for Refugees, Help Age International, and the International Federation on Red Cross. You know, going forward, I want to let you know that next Friday, we will be hearing from uh, Dr. Julita Onabanjo, Regional Director of UNFPA for East and Southern Africa. So we thank you for your attention this morning. For those that have a vacation tomorrow, have a great day. For those that have a vacation on Monday, have a great day. Thank you for the birdies, Cynthia. We heard the birds from Maine. And above all, be safe, be well, and take care of those that you love and you care for. So thank you very much. And we see you next week on Friday. And Andra, Excellent, thank you. Be well.